welcome to the uh, uh, Daniel O. Trainer Wildlife Health Seminar Series. My name is Jennifer Summers. Um, I am the Program Development Specialist for the uh, Wisconsin Center for Wildlife at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, I would like to first of all thank you everybody for, for coming and thank you for joining us. And we have a number of other seminars um, coming up in this series. They're all hosted on Thursdays at 4 p.m. And we have, um, and Dr. Sleeman is, present, is uh, presenting for our very first seminar here. Um, but you can see more information on our website at uh, uwsp.edu slash WCW. So please feel free to check that out if you're interested in any of our other um, seminars. Um, I would like to say thank you to everybody who helped us make this seminar series a, a possibility. Uh, first of all, thank you to Dr. Shelley Dubay, uh, who is one of our wildlife uh, disease experts here at UWSP. Also, thank you to Marie Perkins and to Ben Sunninger, who are also wildlife faculty here at UWSP. And uh, thank you to UW Extension and, of course, to the College of Natural Resources for their assistance as well. So I'd like to take a moment here. Um, this is a, we like to acknowledge our, our tribes um, every time we have a public event. We recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. And before we move on, I also would like to say that to our guests today to please keep your videos off um, and please use the chat for any of any questions and we will answer any questions at the end. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Christine Thomas, our former Dean to introduce uh, um, uh, Daniel Oltrainer. Okay, well, thank you very much for asking me. Uh, it's a real honor. Um, I've spent a lot of time the last few days thinking about Dan Trainer. He was my mentor. I wouldn't be here talking to you today in this capacity if it had not been for Dan. Um, I was one of the people who nominated him and also did a testimonial for him the day that he was uh, inducted into the Wisconsin Conservation Hall of Fame, which was April 22nd, 2006, therefore Earth Day. And uh, I took my remarks from there and I sort of knocked some of it out and I'd like to share the, uh, the rest um, with you. Um, Dan Trainer was one of the great uh, greats in Wisconsin conservation history. He was born in 1926 the same year that Eldo Leopold and Bill Aberg, also inductees into the Conservation Hall of Fame, and members of the Isaac Walton League and other conservation groups elected a governor that put the Wisconsin Conservation Department under control of a citizen commission. Later, at the age of 53, while at the height of his tenure as dean of the largest undergraduate natural resources program in the country, Dan would take his turn on that commission, which came to be known as the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board. He would come to be, I'm gonna talk about the broader Dan here today. Dan was a great wildlife diseases specialist, high, uh, a great scientist, highly published, internationally known for his work, involved in the hottest topics of wildlife health in his time. Uh, but Dan was so much more than that. So I'm talking about the, the greater Dan here today. Um, the board he was on would deal with mining policies, acid rain, and of course, deer management. Um, and uh, later on, uh, he would inspire me to uh, go on and do my PhD work on the role of the Natural Resources Board. And 24 years later, I took my place on that board as well. Trainer grew up in the conservation department. His father spent a career as a conservation warden in the Princeton area. Um, and, uh, and in 1933, when another Wisconsin icon, the Wisconsin Conservation Congress was started, Dan Sr., Dan's father, would spend many years on the Congress, often chairing the big game committee and doubtless dealing with deer issues. Our Dan would often drive his dad to the meetings and later Dan's daughter, Pat Trainer, would do her 
PhD dissertation on the history of the Conservation Congress. So there are a lot of a lot of uh, Dan connections to future natural resources uh, folks. Dan devoted his life to making Wisconsin a great place to live. Over the years, he had a hand in almost every resource management issue that faced the state. He began his natural resources career in 1956 as a wildlife pathologist with the conservation department. He told me that he, he just decided at some point he didn't want to be a lab person. He could be a lab person. He was a great lab person, but he, he, was, um, he loved people. He loved greater sort of interaction with folks. If you went to some kind of an event, that he was in charge of, he wouldn't even eat dinner. He spent all of his time walking around the room, working the crowd, and when the evening was over, he would tell you he was high on people. And so this person who recognized this in himself, that was a quote, high on people, um, just decided that, that being a lab person wasn't where he wanted to be the rest of his life. So in addition to getting his DVM, he got his PhD and he went into um, teaching at the University in Madison. Um, I want to share with you something that happened in his conservation department days though. This, this is his own writing, his words, okay? He interacted with Fred and uh, Fran Hammerstrom, of course, when he worked for the conservation department, the prairie chicken folks from down by Plainfield, they were also involved in the research division at, uh, at the conservation department. So this part is Dan's quote. Back in the days of the Wisconsin Conservation Department, its research bureau held an annual Christmas ball in Madison at an elite ballroom. It was the social event of the year for department personnel and their families, and the participants dressed and acted formally. The Hammerstrons always participated in the ball, and they presented a classic team, the dignified Hammy and the beautiful Fran. At one of these formal events, the Hammerstroms in their formal attire were waltzing away the evening when they encountered me, remember this is Dan's words, in the middle of the dance floor. Hey, Dan, shouted Fran, I have something for you. The dancing stopped, the music stopped, and everyone gathered around Fran in the center of the dance floor. With great fanfare, she opened her handbag and drew out a dead mink. She had found the woman after Shelley's own heart, right? Okay, uh, she had found this carcass several days old on the marsh near her beloved prairie chickens and she wanted to know why it died. At the time, I, I, Dan, was the wildlife disease specialist for the department. So we proceeded to do a necropsy on the spot. Fran in her formal assisted while Fred in his tuxedo kept notes. The necropsy was conducted with a Swiss army knife Kleenex were used as surgical sponges. Instead of rubber gloves, women's formal dress gloves were used, and it was all illuminated by a pen knife. In addition, it was the best dressed gallery ever to witness a necropsy of a mink. So now ending Dan's quote. Okay, During uh, his years as a professor at UW-Madison, he established a graduate program in environmental diseases. His very impressive list of research accomplishments runs the gamut from pesticides to the effects of lead shot to any number of organism caused wildlife diseases. He would have been involved with the Hammerstroms and another Conservation Hall of Fame inductee, Bill Peterbers, and many others on these issues. In 1973, he won a Distinguished Service Award from the Wildlife Diseases Association for these efforts. When Lee Sherman Dreyfus asked Dan to become Dean of the College of Natural Resources, the college enrollment was at just under 1,000. We had just experienced the Gaylord Nelson's first Earth Day and the college was poised for growth. Dan made it his mission to put us on the map. He traveled far and wide across the state. He accepted every speaking engagement at every sports club who would invite him. He was lining up scholarships, incidentally, is what he was doing at those events. 
He got involved in every organization that he could. And over the years, he belonged to nine of the member organizations of the Hall of Fame and dozens of others as well. He assumed leadership positions in many of them. He made it his business to be the state face of the College of Natural Resources. Okay. After leaving the Natural Resources Board, he was appointed to the Citizen Advisory Board of the Public Intervenors Office. He was involved in starting recycling in Stevens Point. He was on the Green Circle Committee. He served as president of the Wisconsin Natural Resources Foundation Board. He helped raise the foundation's share of the money for the hooping crane reintroduction. In fact, we did that together. He and I were the fundraising committee. The list uh, also, uh, the list is enormous. The list also includes lots of other people. And I, tell, I would tell you, Dan would not take credit for any of these things. He would shove all the credit onto somebody else because that's one of the things that he believed in. Um, Dan would tell you that he learned three important lessons from his father. You never quit learning. And clearly Dan was a lifelong learner because you, you heard me mention a whole lot of things that weren't wildlife diseases and you don't become a leader and a policy maker and an influencer on that wide of a variety of subjects without having to learn a whole lot past your wildlife diseases um, knowledge. Um, it takes, number two, it takes people to make things happen and he just loved people. He loved women in every positive sense of that statement. Shelly has heard me say, make that statement before. He mentored, you, you thought you were the most important person in the world to, to him. You meant, he mentored you. There were dozens of other people, and many of them women that he mentored and they all thought they were the most important person in the world to him. I call that the gift, sort of the politician's gift. Um, he, anyway, he, it takes people to make things happen. He understood that you can have the best idea in the world. And if only you believe in that idea, it's likely going nowhere. I used to joke when I was Dean that Dan Trainer said it was okay for a Dean to have an idea once in a while, but nobody can know. And uh, so he always made sure that others thought the idea was theirs. Um, and third, whatever you do, make sure you're having fun at it. And I'm gonna share a story. Um, I spent a lot of time with Dan down in his old stomping grounds in the Princeton area where he grew up. He, he went to Princeton High School and he, he graduated from Ripon College, I think after he got out of the Navy. Um, I got my first turkey with Dan down there, and I'm sure that that's a day that both of us would count among our top hunts ever. And, and so driving back and forth to Princeton and out in the turkey blind, we had a lot of time to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, and on one of our excursions, uh, Dan shared a story with me that affected his life and mine also because of the effect he had on me over the years. And I don't think he would mind if I shared this. He and his dad and one of his dad's friends spent the day pheasant hunting. In those days, you could hunt on the neighbors and there were rarely tr no trespassing signs. They had seen a few birds and they had missed a few. Our Dan groused about this and that all day long. And when they came in for lunch, his father told them that he could clean his gun and put it away, that he and the friend would go out alone in the afternoon. He told Dan that he had complained enough in the morning, obviously was not enjoying the company, the environment or the activity, and that there was no sense doing things if you weren't having fun. Dan learned from that experience and lived by it the rest of his life. And he's, he was so much fun to be around. He had, you can see this in the pictures. He was always smiling. He always had a great attitude. He always had a joke. He was a great practical joker. And he is, we worked hard in our office and we really accomplished a lot. And he would say that you can have, as long as we get the job done, you can have fun and that you shouldn't be doing anything that you're not having fun at. Of course, there are negative aspects to every job. But he said, if you're not having fun at your job, then you should go find another job. 
And that was his, uh, his philosophy. And that brings me to Dan's greatest contribution to the environment, in my opinion. It was his teaching and mentoring of students, faculty, citizens, and resource professionals through five decades of involvement in Wisconsin conservation. He took his place in the line of great conservationists. He led by example. He remembered his roots. He inspired others to be their best and contribute however they could. He approached life with enthusiasm and good humor, and uh, it, it was my great uh, fortune to have met and uh, been appreciated by Dan Trainer. And thank you so much for inviting me to do this. I have loved the college for 42 years, and between COVID and retiring, I'm feeling like... Um, a person who has read a really long and really wonderful novel and you get to the last page and the characters go on without you and you don't know what they're doing. So thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, and I uh, mentioned to Dr. Sleeman that it's really great that he's kicking this off because the founder of his lab in Madison, Milt Friend, and Dan Trainer were fast friends. And I met Milt many times through the years because of Dan. So this is really a fortuitous start to the seminar. And I apologize if I took any of your time, Jonathan. So thank you very much. Not a problem, it was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, do you want me to start, Jen? Yes, please. Okay, so... Um, Wow, I, it, I feel real nervous talking after Dean Thomas, but um, uh, I do have the distinct uh, honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Sleeman. He's the director of the USGS National Wildlife Health Center just down the road in Madison, uh, where he leads a team of scientists and support staff to investigate and research wildlife diseases that threaten wildlife populations, public health, and the economy. He received his master's in zoology and his vet degree, a veterinary degree from the University of Cambridge. So he talks a little funny, but that's okay. Um, and completed his, uh, an internship and residency in zoological medicine at the University of Tennessee. Um, what, one of the things I find most compelling about the work that Dr. Sleeman has done over his career is he's always ferreting out very interesting wildlife disease questions. And the one that I always think about is when he and his team, when he was the director of the Wildlife Center of Virginia, there were some box turtles that were coming into the rehab center um, and nobody knew what was going on. And through a series of really elegant um, experiments and field research, they kind of determined the cause of that. Um, and it was really, I just, I, I use that as an example in my captive wildlife classes, how, how people who are work with captive animals can contribute to science. And so that was one of the reasons that I thought Jonathan would be an outstanding um, addition to our seminar series. And so with that, I will, I will let Dr. Sleeman give his talk. Thank you, Shelley, so much for the introduction and, and everybody for the honor of, of um, being the first presenter in the seminar series. Um, just making sure I can get my slides up here. Technology, can you see my, my presentation? Excellent. Well, very good. So, so, um, so um, I am very excited to be here. I uh, very, very much appreciate the introductions. And um, uh, what I've got today, this afternoon, is I'm going to sort of talk, talk a sort of, sort of some big picture concepts regarding some of the global environmental health challenges that we're facing currently. Um, talk more specifically about emerging diseases and, and then and then sort of some strategies for surveillance of wildlife diseases that we've been developing, uh, illustrate those techniques using the case study of whiteness syndrome, and then return, I think, to some 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 big quick uh, big picture questions. And so uh, hopefully it'll be of interest and hopefully it will stimulate a little bit of dialogue. So um, probably goes without saying in, in this current uh, uh, environment that, that we are facing several profound and, and very challenging uh, global health and environmental issues. These things range from you know, climatic change, emerging infectious diseases, and the picture here is of a, a bat with whiteness syndrome that we'll talk 
in more detail about detail about later on. You know, you know, fragmented landscapes and changes in land use, global contaminants and pollution, inequities in access to, to healthcare and resources, issues with food security. Um, and these all factors are, are, are combining in many ways to create a global environment that's favoring the emergence of, of, of infectious diseases. Um, and that's obviously something of particular interest for us in the wildlife field and particularly in the wildlife health field. And, and you probably know that many of these, these, these threats that are threatening human, animal and ecosystem health are very much of wildlife origin. And we're seeing that currently right now with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Whilst the exact origin of that virus has, has yet to be determined, um, it's very likely that progenitors are, are SARS-like viruses found in bats, uh, short, uh, horseshoe bats in China, uh, and just another example of, of, of emerging disease of wildlife origin. And because we're a globally connected uh, uh, community these days with lots of people traveling by, by flights, um, lots of global trade uh, and transportation, these, these pathogens can spread very quickly around the world as we've seen with, with COVID-19. And certainly um, we've seen that this change in the nature of diseases over time since the foundation of the National Wildlife Health Center. So, so Milt founded the center in, in 1975. Uh, and the first couple of decades of our, our, our existence, um, the, the types and number of diseases that we investigated didn't really change over time. But also like things like avian cholera, avian botulism, they, whilst they can cause some pretty large scale die-offs, uh, they tend to remain, you know, in terms of outbreaks in, in, in fairly confined geographic regions. Um, they're not really a human health issue or, or an agricultural animal issue. And they don't really, except in a few rare circumstances, threaten the persistence uh, of wildlife populations or wildlife species. When you look at the, the timeline, though, since the 1990s, uh, you'll see a number of pretty profound changes. First of all, it seems that every two to three years, uh, a new emerging disease uh, appears on the landscape starting from the amphibian mal malformations in the 1990s, West Nile virus in 1999, then chronic wasting disease in 2002, 2003 here in Wisconsin, um, even influenza, whitener syndrome. And then actually uh, we need to add a couple of new diseases. We, we're just doing right now dealing with large outbreaks of a foreign animal disease called rabbit hemorrhagic disease, virus two in the Southwest of the United States. And then obviously with COVID-19. I think also these diseases, um, uh, you know, rather than remaining confined or restricted to a geographic zone, uh, they're spreading very rapidly across the landscape. So West Nile virus went from discovery in 1999 in New York to the West Coast in a, in a period of four years. As we'll see with Whitener syndrome, that continues to spread across the continent of the, of the US. Um, they're also driving extinctions, particularly with the chytrid fungus in, in amphibians or causing marked declines in, in wildlife populations. They're also um, of multi-sector interest. So avian influenza, uh, certainly um, West Nile virus to a certain extent, chronic wasting disease. Um, they're, they're either a zoonotic disease or of serious economic concern, which is really requiring us to, to, to work more, more collaboratively in a one health approach with our you know, counterparts in agriculture and, and public health. So this is a very long introduction to, to say that really the, 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 we was really seen an increase in, in, in the need and the importance of conducting wildlife disease surveillance. And, and in fact, you know, uh, the World Organization of Animal Health about 10 years ago made a declaration during a global conference on wildlife regarding the need to increase the capacity of all countries worldwide to con conduct surveillance, particularly early detection, and then initiate appropriate responses to outbreaks and the spread of diseases in, in, in wildlife. Now, as many of you may know, there are some unique challenges with conducting wildlife disease surveillance. Very rarely are we presented with this picture, uh, you know, a, a, a large animal, obviously sick with a head tilt, walking down the road. Um, sick and dead animals are often very difficult to find. They may, uh, these outbreaks may occur in very remote locations. Sick animals are also more likely to hide and therefore harder to discover. Uh, and wild animals are also very good at disguising illness and therefore uh, aren't always recognized as being, as being sick. Um, carcasses um, are very often quickly removed from the landscape um, by scavengers. Um, certainly some sensitive species, um, particularly the amphibians, marine mammals, uh, fish, these carcasses will decompose very rapidly, rendering, rendering them useless for diagnostic purposes. So often it's just a, a pile of feathers and bones 
or, or in this case of this whale, just a, a blob of blubber. And then obviously on the sort of the technological side, uh, a lot of the routine diagnostic tests that have been developed for domestic animals may not be valid for use of wild, wild animals. And then from a biological perspective, we often lack that basic information about population sizes, but some of the baseline health measures and, and really making it hard to assess the, the, the significance of some of these disease outbreaks. But, it, but I, I think as I hopefully we'll, we'll present, we are starting to develop, I, I think some, some good techniques in, in, in disease surveillance and really starting to do some um, robust programs. Now, just a little bit of background. Surveillance is really the ongoing collection of data um, and dissemination of that data to, 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 to folks that need to know and take action. So it's, it's a very active process. It's, it's about providing data for action. And, it, and it's classified in a number of different ways. Firstly, by the means by which data are collected. Is it actively collected or is it collected sort of passively? Uh, the focus, are you searching for a particular pathogen or are you searching more generally looking for what diseases could potentially be out there on the landscape? And it's also classified on the way in which the units of observation are selected. Uh, is it a structured survey, I, I, some, some sense of random sampling, or, or is it using non-random data, data sources? And surveillance is generally classified into sort of two main categories, the active versus the passive surveillance. Active, as I mentioned, involves actively searching for particular information. Passive usually involves data collected from disease observations on an ad hoc basis. And I'll, I'll talk, give you some examples in a little bit. And then there's the general surveillance, uh, which is again, scanning for uh, any type of disease that could be in a population versus the pathogen specific or the targeted surveillance, which is where you're looking for a particular type of pathogen. Now, probably the, the most common type of surveillance that we do for wildlife, at least in the United States, is general passive surveillance, which is mostly investigations of unusual wildlife um, um, morbidity and mortality events. And these can be pretty dramatic. The, the, the picture on the top is, is from a saiga antelope um, outbreak that took place in, in Kazakhstan uh, three or four years ago, uh, where, where um, Hundreds of thousands of saiga died um, simultaneously, almost simultaneously, in, in a sudden outbreak. This is an a threatened species in that country. So when you lose 90% of that population in one outbreak, that clearly is a is a significant concern. What's interesting about this picture is you can see that these the, these uh, animals are are, are, um, are spaced pretty evenly apart across the landscape, and that's how saiga graze um, uh, on this landscape. And that tells you that the mortality was pretty acute. Turned out it was a, a, a um, the cause was uh, pastoralosis uh, or so-called shipping fever, probably as a consequence of some environmental changes that were taking place at the time. But sometimes these outbreaks just involve the, the, the one animal, um, as in this lion uh, from Kruger National Park. And, and that's where it can be quite challenging. The top case is pretty obvious of why that's a significant event, but a single animal landscape may or may not signify um, uh, uh, you know, a problem. This line actually, line actually turns out to be the index case of, of bovine tuberculosis in, in Kruger National Park, which actually has turned out to be a significant impediment to, 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 to the conservation of these line, line populations. So why do we want to investigate mortality events? Well, clearly knowing the cause of death allows us to take some management actions to, 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 to control that particular outbreak at the time, but also to look in the future and say, how can we prevent these outbreaks taking place uh, in the future. It's also an extremely useful way to monitor for, 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 for new and emerging pathogens. Um, through our ongoing surveillance um, of wildlife, we were, we were um, able to help um, diagnose West Nile virus in New York in 1999. It was the same time those, um, as you probably were, those um, unexplained encephalitis cases of humans in New York. At the same time, they're seeing um, these, these die-offs of crows in, in zoos and, and parks. And it was through making that connection that, that, that the Wildlife Conservation Society and ourselves are other to, uh, able to determine is actually a novel disease that was in really recently introduced into the US with the West Nile virus. But also, also through, that, through the similar activity, through a, an investigation of a die-off of waterfowl in Washington state in, in 2014, uh, that died of a, another cause besides uh, avian influenza, they actually died of aspergillosis. But through that investigation, we were able to detect 
the first introduction of Asian strain highly pathogenic avian influenza here in the United States. But it's also useful for monitoring you know, ecosystem and human health threats. Sensitive species like fish could signal environmental changes or, or problems with water quality or, 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 or the introduction of contaminants or pollutants. And often there's just general public concern or interest regarding these, these, these die offs. Um, you know, why, why is the 5,000 birds died in, in, in our town or village? Um, and I just want to know, just to provide a level of reassurance. Now, whilst I called it passive surveillance, it, 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 it actually, it's actually a fairly intensive process. There's a, a fair amount of needed capabilities necessary to, in order to conduct mortality surveillance. You need a partner network that's out there that's trained to recognize problems and report these events and get samples to you. You obviously need diagnostic pathologists and microbiologists, epidemiologists that can collect the field data to do the data analysis, the sample collection, and some system to manage that data and communicate that information out to the to, to, to decision makers. So this is a great technique. It, it's, it, it, it has the advantages, it's opportunistic or convenient sampling, um, and it's relatively cost effective compared to um, active surveillance. Um, and it's probably the most common type of surveillance, as I mentioned. This, the disadvantages is that it can be difficult to determine what's unusual. And that requires good baseline uh, data and good sort of use of your, your, your experience and acumen. Obviously, you can't make any sort of estimates about prevalence or statistical inferences about the population because uh, you don't know the extent of that mort mortality and it's often just the tip of the iceberg. And it usually requires the whole carcass. And, and um, as you can see in that picture, when I mean, you've got a, a die off of, of mountain gorillas that, that are several hours inside a national park, it can be quite an endeavor to get these animals out where, 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 where a necropsy uh, or a pathology examination can be conducted. Now, the other major category of, of surveillance is what's is called active targeted surveillance. And this is very important for kind of three main goals, uh, particularly early detection, when you want to establish whether disease is present or a pathogen is present as soon as possible. And this is very important, obviously, the, the earlier you detect something, the more quickly you can respond and the more effective your management actions can be. It's also a very important technique for assessing the spatial distribution, the prevalence of the disease, what exactly is in the landscape. It's also very important for monitoring um, effects of your management actions. Are you actually having a, a positive uh, impact uh, on reducing disease prevalence through your different management actions? And um, as I'll talk about in, in a, a second, it, it tends to be a, quite a, a labor-intensive, resource-intensive endeavor. So it usually focuses on those diseases that are that are you know ha have high consequence, um, of great significance in terms of the economy, that are zoonotic, or it's really serious conservation concern. So, but there are a number of examples to, uh, right now in the U.S. Uh, we'll talk about Whitener syndrome in bats, the highly pathogenic highly pathogenic avian influenza surveillance in the US is probably one of the biggest projects that we've ever undertaken in, in the US. Uh, and it's been a multi-agency uh, collaboration. Uh, the spread of African swine fever and wild boar in Europe is a, is a major concern. A very good project here that's run by the, um, the United States Department of Agriculture is they do a lot of surveillance uh, for rabies and carnivores to basically to evaluate the effectiveness of the oral rabies vaccine barrier that's being, that's being um, distributed uh, on the east coast of the United States. Now, one subset of, of, of active surveillance is, is something we've been working on is, is weighted surveillance. And I'd be amiss if not, to not talk about chronic weight sensitive disease in here in Wisconsin. But this, this technique exploits the observed differences in disease prevalence across different strata within populations. And, and obviously a sick um, deer, as, as seen in this picture, is more likely um, to have chronic wasting disease and a healthy, healthy deer. So we, we can use that knowledge and, and knowledge of actually how more likely it is to have uh, chronic wasting disease to actually target those animals in our surveillance. We may actually be able to meet our, 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 our surveillance goals more quickly by targeting these, these, these higher risk subspe sub, subset, subset of, of the population than if we say sampled yearlings, which we know have a lot lower uh, uh, prevalence. And so the fact that deer with chronic wasting disease display these neurologic signs and, and emaciation as in this picture is a very useful uh, piece of information we can use to target our surveillance. So obviously this allows um, us to increase the probability of detecting an infected animal. Um, 
because we're sampling sick animals and, and result in a lot more cost effective uh, uh, um, program than if you're just using ran random sampling alone. Um, obviously the disadvantages it can result in a fewer samples because it's harder to find those high risk animals. It's sometimes reliant on the animal, animal presenting itself or testing. And again, it can be harder to make predictions concerning pre prevalence and it's still a very much an experimental method. One of the most sort of simple techniques for, for targeted surveillance is just active random sampling. Um, again, it's used for those uh, diseases of, 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 of high consequence. And it's also particularly important when you want to set a certain, um, have a certain confidence of freedom from disease. Um, so if you, you know, and these are particularly with regular diseases, you know, that's regulated by the World Organization of Animal Health. If a country needs to declare itself free from a certain disease, it's gonna to have to do a certain level of surveillance um, to determine that probability of, of being free at your, your, your desired prevalence. And obviously it involves a lot more complex and rigorous approaches to design. So you can have st statistical validity in, in, in the results and make unbiased inferences about your population of, of interest. And again, there are various techniques that we can use, the, the simple random sampling, as, as shown in this diagram, we usually just grid out our population and randomly select grids for, for sampling and go in and, and, and sample those grids. Slightly more sophisticated is to actually do stratified random sampling where you um, stratify your, your population based on geographic location, age or sex or whatever, the risk factors you've identified and then sample randomly within the different, different strata. I think an increasingly used technique is this un, unequal probability random sampling so this is basically risk-based spatial targeting of, of samples. So the example like here is um, we have a, a big concern about the potential introduction of a newly discovered chytrid fungus in salamanders called b cell. Uh, this chytrid fungus causes large-scale mortality of salamanders in Europe and, and, and it originates from Asia. We're very concerned about its potential introduction in North America via the pet trade. Um, and so we wanted it to institute some early, early detection surveillance for salamanders um, in the United States, but we have very limited resources. So we actually ended up doing this risk assessment, looking at where the potential ports of entry are, um, obviously New York, Atlanta, the, 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 the West Coast, um, Chicago, where are the populations of salamanders most of interest and are potentially susceptible, um, and, and then develop this basically this heat map of look, going from low risk to high risk, and using this heat map to target our surveillance and where we think the most, the highest risk um, populations for, for exposure to this, to this, um, this pathogen. Another other technique is adaptive cluster sampling. This is uh, particularly helpful, uh, like in chronic wasting disease. Uh, again, we, we can start off with random sampling, but the, when you get a detection, you then start to, to, to sample those grids around that detection to, to, to get an idea of, of the local distribution. And this is a very useful technique for um, diseases that aren't that are often clustered on the landscape. They're not evenly distributed, like we see with chronic wasting disease. So again, it's a, it's a it's a great technique. It allows the application of statistical uh, methods um, and probability detection models. It allows you to make inferences about the population, and you can make, as I mentioned, the statements about your confidence of the, the probability of the presence or absence of a disease at a certain prevalence, prevalence level. The disadvantages are the population can be difficult to define. You can need pretty large sample sizes to detect diseases at low prevalence. For example, over 4,500 samples are required to detect a disease at a 0.1% prevalence at a 99% confidence level. These techniques are based on assumptions of random sampling and 100% test sensitivity and specificity. And those assumptions are very rarely uh, met when, it, when, it, when we're dealing with wildlife um, species. And then, as I mentioned, it can be expensive and time consuming. Anyway, so that's um, so the basic introduction to, to, to wildlife disease surveillance and some techniques. The next part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about how we've applied those to a particular case here. And, and what I thought I'd do is just try some audience participation. So this is often what, what um, you know, how we first start to investigate a disease is a a partner will contact us, um, they'll notice something unusual and they'll either send us a picture or the note 
Um, so, so I was wondering if you could just, just take a minute to write in the chat box what you think is wrong with this picture. And, and don't be shy. And audience, only participation only works if you participate. All right, yeah, so you guys are really smart. So you've picked up immediately this, um, you know, I didn't tell you the species, but it's an insectivorous bat. It's very unusual for it to be flying outside in wintertime when there's no insects. Uh, so clearly this is a, uh, um, something's obviously going, going wrong. And this is actually how we were first alerted to, to white nose syndrome um, in North America. So around 2006 in the wintertime, uh, biologists in New York started reporting seeing bats outside the high binocular during winter, this was very unusual. So they asked us to come out and help with, a, with, with an investigation. So we sent a field team out. My slides are frozen for a second. Oh, so we sent a field team out and this is what they saw. So two main kind of clini clinical uh, uh, presentations here. The first one is you, can, you may not see um, well, but on the floor of this cave, it's just littered with dead bats. You can actually see some some of the bats actually frozen within these within these icicles. So so first presentation large scale mortality 90 99 percent of the bats in these hypernacular are dead. Um, so the bats that are alive they presented with this this clinical picture, and what you can see here is this white fuzzy material, particularly over the nose, hence hence what, why the disease ended up being called white nose syndrome. But also you can see it's present along all the non furred parts of the skin, the legs and the wings and the ears and so forth. So our, our field biologists, they collected some samples and collected some whole carcasses. They took them back to lab and we did full diagnostic workups, you know, pathology, microbiology, toxicology, parasitology. And lo and behold, we could not find a single consistent pathogen or, 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 or toxin or contaminant was causing um, th this problem. And so what our, our biologists, our, our diagnostic microbiologists at the time, Dr. David Lehert did, is, is rather than incubate his cultures at room temperature, or, or, or um, in an incubator at 37 degrees, which is your standard technique, he decided to place his, his cultures in a fridge, basically replicating the cave environment. And actually only after he did that that he started getting uh, single um, pure growths of this fungus. And this fungus, um, here you can see electron uh, micrographs of them, had very unusual um, characteristics with these curved conidia attached to these hyphae. And actually, uh, actually, he ended up being able to detect and isolate a, 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 a fungus that had previously been undescribed in the scientific community. It's now named Pseudogymnoascus destructans, or PD. And it's the first time a fungus in this, in, this, in this genus has been identified as a pathogen of vertebrates. It's psychrophilic, i.e. It's, it's cold loving. It prefers to grow in cold environments. Uh, and the, the perfect pathogen to a to attack bats. So that's how we ended up describing um, uh, 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 and characterizing the disease white nose syndrome. So white nose syndrome is, is basically a disease of, of hibernating insectivorous bats. It causes very, very high mortality of these bats. It's associated with some marked population declines and now is considered a major threat to the persistence of, of several species of, of, of um, of our native North American bats. As I mentioned, this disease was first detected um, in, um, in New York in 2006. You can see the little circle right there. Um, but then um, we're running out of colors of the rainbow here, but then has basically radiated from that source and spread throughout North America. It's now been found on the West Coast. Um, the fungus has been found in California. The, the disease, white nose syndrome, has been found in Washington State. And I think over, over 25 states now ha have uh, cases of white, white nose syndrome. And there seems to be no geographic barriers to its continued spread um, throughout this, this country. Um, I think there's about now 11 different species that are, are now known to be affected by white nose syndrome. And the, the extent to which they're affected, it seems to be vary from species to species. Little brown bats in particular being very hard hit with some very marked declines and, and models predict they're gonna go extinct locally, especially on the East Coast. The Indiana bat and gray bat are, bo are both, gray bats are both endangered species. The Northern long bat has also been particularly badly affected 
Uh, what's interesting is, is, is that bat as I now listed as threatened um, because of the impacts of whiteness syndrome. And I think that's the first time the Fish and Wildlife Service have listed a, a, a species as threatened or endangered as a consequence of, uh, uh, or solely because of a disease issue. Now, I don't want to get too into the, into the pathology, but this is kind of interesting because, you know, the, it was actually a fair amount of resistance from the, 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 the biology and the scientific community when we first published these findings because fungi very rarely cause uh, prime, uh, uh, primary pathogens and actually cause mortality. Athlete's foot is irritating, but very rarely kills you. So we actually did a lot of research to try and understand why this, this, this fungus um, kills bats. And these are histopathological sections of the wings of bats. That's the outside of the wing. This is the internal tissue and then the, and the, and the, the outside. Um, and what you can see is, is the fungus, the hyphae on the top of the skin, but it's not just a superficial infection. It actually um, um, uh, invades very deeply into the tissues. So it's a very disruptive to the integument of, 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 of these bats. And what's important to know is these wings are not just important for flight. They're also uh, critical for, for, for heat dissipation, they're critical for water control and salt regulation, gas exchange and blood pressure regulation. So it basically ha has these profound physiological effects. It causes bats to obviously arouse during hibernation, as you saw in the picture, it causes them to go seek food, food resources, deplete the, 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 the fat reserves, and ending up with emaciation and death. So it's a really a, quite, a, quite a profound um, physiological process. The other thing is maybe, and you get a little bit of details here, but um, the pathologists among you may, may, may see that actually there's, there's no inflammatory response at all. Normally when you get an invasive organism like this, you'll see, you'll see the inf inflammation cells coming around to attack that. And here there's no, no sign of any, any inflammation. So we're not entirely sure why, um, but it's obviously one of the reasons why they get this, these um, um, you know, really extensive infections. Um, either it's because bats are, the immune system's naturally downregulated during hibernation. We're also though finding that there may be some evidence of the, these uh, fungi sort of, um, suppress immunosuppressive factors, which actually may suppress the natural immune, immune function um, of these bats. It's an area of active research. What was also very interesting was, was when we started publishing this information, we got contacted by a lot of colleagues in Europe saying, hey, we see the same clinical signs, uh, this fuzzy material on, on the noses of, of our bats, but, but we don't see the same sort of mortality. Um, and so we asked them to send them some samples. And sure enough, the, the fungus is the exact same fungus that we find in, in bats in North America. And actually, um, our colleagues in Canada, when I did experimental work and actually showed the fungus actually will cause the same mortality of, 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 of uh, uh, North American species of bats, but they don't seem the same, same mortality in, in, in Europe. Again, not entirely sure why, you know, the species tend to be a little bit larger bodied in Europe. They don't tend to hibernate in such large congreg congregations. There's an intriguing hypothesis in that you look at the fossil record of some of these caves, uh, about 10,000 years ago, there's, there's some um, large um, finds of, of, of numbers of bones in these caves. And so this, the hypothesis that actually this fungus may have gone through European bats several, you know, several thousand years ago caused mortality and what we're seeing is the, the remnant population. Anyway, that's all, 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 all hypotheses. But what was interesting, we actually ended up doing some, some phylogeographic work. So actually doing uh, genetic sequencing of these different strains of fungus, both European and North American. Um, actually done doing sort of phylogenetic analysis, looking at genetic relation, relatedness of these different strains. And, and the, the top right is the, all, the, all the different um, European strains. And the length of the line just shows you the, 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 the difference in, in, in genetics, the genetic relationship. And you can see that SMPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So there's about 18,000 different uh, SNPs, which shows you there's a fair amount of genetic diversity of the strains found in Europe. Whereas the bottom left of the slide is all the uh, North American strains. And there's only about a hundred SNP, SNPs amongst these. So basically it's all the same strain. So this is, provides very strong evidence that what, we, what, what resulted is a single introduction of, of PD into North America. And that then ha has then gone to spread throughout, throughout North, North America. 
and we probably will never know exactly how how PD got into North America. But going back to my uh, my be beginning slide, it's probably a good example of how pathogens can be dispersed through global travel and trade. Um, the most likely hypothesis is is a caver from Europe came over North America with their caving equipment and their boots, probably brought the fungal spores or, or the pathogen with them, started caving in, in caves in New York and then introduced a pathogen, uh, which then oh, probably over several years um, uh, built up to, to sufficient um, numbers to then start infecting on North American bats. And for those of you that you know, are familiar with sort of in, in invasion biology, uh, you know that, that once an organism finds a new ecological niche or niche, it tends to not be constrained by uh, uh, it, it usual constraints in, in its native habitat and, and then can explode and take off very rapidly, which I think is what's happened with white nose syndrome in, in North America. So um, again, going back to the theme of surveillance, so, so as this disease has moved across the landscape, we really have to shift have shifted the type of surveillance we do Populations of bats are fairly easy to find or easier to find on the East Coast. They tend to congregate in, in, in larger uh, uh, um, groups. Uh, using mortality as a way to do surveillance for white nose syndrome worked very well on the East Coast. But as the diseases moved West, those populations are a bit more cryptic, but they're harder to find and they're obviously harder to conduct surveillance for. So we're shifting from um, sampling you know, not dead bats to, to actually doing some environmental sampling, guano sampling, actually looking for the fungus and as well as sampling bats when, when, when we can them, when we can find them. And so we've actually used um, a, a model derived uh, system for, for priority sampling. It's based on a spread model. So we try to predict where we believe PD will spread next based on its current distribution. We've then selected those eco, eco sections uh, that we believe where we were, we're predicting the range expansion to occur. And then those little dots are different sampling, sampling sites. And we distributed sampling kits to those states to collect samples. Uh, and, and it's gonna hopefully will be a very important sort of early warning system to detect the um, early spread of PD into new areas. Also, hopefully it will give us um, data where we can actually start to analyze the rate of spread across the landscape, which again will help us to predict where it's gonna go next and when it will arrive next in, in, in states out, out west. Just very briefly on, on management. So unfortunately with white nose syndrome, um, good tools remain um, quite elusive. The fungus survives very well in cave sediments, which as you know, can complicate disease control efforts. There are a lot of research looking at different antifungal agents, but applying these biologicals to bats in these complex cave environments can be very challenging. And actually this, we've got some evidence to show that may be actually quite detrimental. There's some evidence, some research we're doing right now to show that um, native fungi in these sediments may actually have a suppressive effect on PD. So blanket application of antifungals may actually um, be detrimental to the control of white nose syndrome. We're now right, right now working on a, a potential vaccine. It, it's based on technology we've used for other vaccine. It's a recombinant vaccine where we spliced in gene, a couple of uh, genes that we know stimulate uh, a, a, a antifungal immunity, uh, calnexin and serine protease. But developing methods to, to deliver this, this vaccine using sort of topical gels, um, which actually techniques is used to, 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 to dose vampire bats in South America to control them for, rab for, for rabies. Um, and, and we've done some, some lab work to show that this vaccine does have a, a protective effect against uh, infection with white nose syndrome. And right now, actually last summer, last winter and this winter, we're actually piloting some field field trials actually here in Wisconsin, um, where we're actually um, applying, the, applying the, the vaccine. We, we put um, little, little chips in the, in, in the bats, we release them into these caves, and we actually, it's like a mark, you know, capture, recapture technique to actually look at survival of these of vaccinated versus unvaccinated bats in these cave environments. Well, actually, there are mines in Wisconsin. And then, um, you know, I think obviously the, discussion of white nose syndrome and bats is very topical. This week is actually has to, happens to be Bat Appreciation Week. And bats are pretty important members of our, of our ecosystems and biological community. Um, they, they're the primary predators of a lot of insects, particularly insects 
that uh, consume the insects that destroy agricultural crops. Um, they um, um, so these declines on bat populations could eco influence ecosystem functions in way in ways that we cannot predict. You know, related to forest health um, and, and other aspects. They do eat, eat mosquitoes. They could have some implications for, for uh, transmission of vector-borne diseases. And we did a, a study, US just did a study um, several years ago, um, looking at the economic uh, impact and, and um, made an estimate that bats contribute up to $50 billion annually to the US agricultural economy through the insect control service of so protection of crops. Also reducing the amount of in insecticides farmers have to use to control the in insects. Again, you wanna put this in, the, so who, who likes tequila and margaritas? Yeah, uh, so yeah, everybody, I mean, who, I mean, most people do. And actually the, the agave plant from which um, tequila is made is pollinated by a single species of bat. So no bats, no pollination, no tequila, no margarita, and the world would be a, 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 a vastly poorer place. Anyway, um, so I just thought I'd end with just some, some future directions for, for, for wildlife health and wildlife surveillance. Um, one of the things, the challenges that we have is that um, we don't really have a unified system for disease surveillance in wildlife in the United States. Uh, you know, with our sort of governmental system, a lot of surveillance is done by states and by multiple federal agencies. And that can lead to a sort of very fragmented picture. So one of the tools we've been working on is this wildlife health information sharing partnership, which will allow all our partners to enter their data on, on, on wildlife diseases to give us a bit more complete picture of what's happening in, in the country. Um, and then will allow us to hopefully to do a, hopefully more, more uh, detailed analyses about risk factors related to emergent disease. We're also hoping to the, the, the system eventually will allow us to import other data layers, like looking at landscape change, uh, uh, you know, cl cl climate data, other types of data, where we can actually start to do some anal analyses looking at the environmental drivers of these diseases. And what we really would like to do is shift from sort of reactive, finding dead, dead things in the landscape, figuring out what, what they are, to being a bit more proactive and actually understanding why things, are, why, why mortality events are happening in the first place and institute preventive measures to actually prevent them from happening. We're actually piling into a project looking at, see if we can predict when avian botulism can take place on the, on the landscape, give the refuge managers that knowledge and they can start taking proactive management of the, of the water uh, bodies to actually hopefully prevent the, the outbreaks occurring in the first place. Another project with the, that we're working on too is, is using artificial intelligence for avian influenza. And that can actually actually can forecast when avian influenza could potentially be coming across the landscape. It's really interesting. Uh, the radar data that you see when you see the weather forecasts uh, not only captures the sort of data on precipitation and cloud cover, but also captures bilateral data. So you can see in the green and yellow, that's your, your classic sort of uh, um, uh, cold front coming through with rain. But behind that, you see these blobs, that's actually migratory birds. And so these radar actually pick up that bilateral data. They remove it for, for the weather forecasting, but that's data we can use to actually see if we can track migratory birds along across the landscape. This could be used to give farmers an early warning about when birds could be coming in to their area and when they could actually potentially be carrying avian influenza, allowing those farms to institute sort of on-farm biosecurity measures uh, to prevent introduction of, of avian influenza. And we're working with Cornell University, the Lab of Ornithology, to see if we can actually use artificial intelligence and machine learning um, program um, the, the system to actually learn what species they are and actually obviously provide a bit more accurate estimate of whether the waterfowl or other potential species. Now, finally, I come back to this One Health uh, concept. Again, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it's something that we've been looking at. Uh, and I think it's a really useful conceptual framework to start to think about some solutions to these challenges that I mentioned at the beginning, the beginning of the presentation. One Health is defined as a collaborative effort of multiple discipline sectors working locally, nationally, regionally, and globally with the goal of achieving optimal outcomes, recognizing that human health, animal health, wildlife health, and environmental health are all interconnected. And, and if you believe that interconnection, um, 
you begin to recognize that if you harm one sector, like the wildlife sector or the environmental sector, that also is also going to harm human health and domestic animal health. And we are really going to achieve sort of one health. We have to start integrating and considering the environmental um, and wildlife health factors. And again, I think we've seen this. And I see Billy, Billy Koresh is one of the future presenters on these seminars, and I'm sure he's going to talk about this, about COVID-19. But I think we've seen this with, with COVID-19, and it's unsustainable trade in wildlife and, and, and utilization of wildlife in, in, in these wet markets has led to this, this, this pandemic, which has had very tragic con con consequences to the world. So we've been starting to think about how, how to sort of take that concept and start to apply it to come up with some solutions to these glo global problems. So we developed this concept as one health impact pyramid. So basically this, this, what this is, is outlines the different sort of interventions or strategies you can use. Um, starting off with just basic education, advocacy and awareness, clinical interventions, you know, treatment of individual animals, long lasting, long lasting protective interventions like vaccines, changing the context to make default, de default decisions healthy, i.e. legislation, so, to the socioeconomic factors, um, you know, the inequities and um, you know, uh, social factors and economic factors that lead to Ill, Ill health, then also the environmental factors, all the environmental changes, um, climate change, land use change, and so forth. What the py pyramid is meant to show is like, um, that factors, the interventions at the top of the pyramid are easier to, 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 to institute. It's easier to, to, to do edu education uh, and, and clinical interventions, but they don't have as a, a, a larger scale uh, uh, an impact. Whereas factors at the base of the pyramid, the socioeconomic factors and the environmental factors, are much harder to, to affect those change, but clearly have much more profound um, impacts and, uh, and, um, and, and consequences, positive consequences. And also, are um, you know looking at the environmental factors, socioeconomic factors, not just going to help help human health, agricultural health, but also hopefully protect wildlife health. So anyway, we're starting to start to look at this concept, use a systems approach to start to actually pilot some projects where we can actually start focusing our efforts on, on these socioeconomic and environmental factors that underpin all health on, on this on this planet. Anyway, again, I very much appreciate the opportunity to give this seminar. Uh, thanks very much for, for, for allowing me to, to present and I'd be more than happy to take any questions that we have if we have time. Excellent, thank you so much, Jonathan. That was, that was really great. And I learned so much of like that stuff about the, the different um, fungi that occur in the caves that could help to suppress PD's persistence. Who knew? I mean, that that's really fascinating stuff. I mean, is it what do you what do you think's going on there? I mean, what is it just like dog eat dog world in the in bat caves, or I mean, in terms of fungi versus fungi, or what's what would be the reasoning for our for that relationship? Hmm. No, I think I think if, I think exactly. So I'm going a little bit outside of my area of expertise, but there's a fair amount of research to show that that the microbiological agents in these communities are always competing with each other. So so, so they're, they're constantly issuing suppressive factors or or, or 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 trying to change the environment that's more conducive to their survival. So you're absolutely right. I think it's 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 just that it's that dog eat dog world in these environments, and with these with these organisms constantly trying to. It's like a war, you know, constant battle where they're trying to outcompete each other. Um, and that's the best explanation I can give you. Um, well, the natives maybe are out competing the non-natives, which is right. what you would want to happen. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm still thinking about a world without tequila, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I might just roll through some of the questions that are popping up. Um, oh, sure. Yeah one of my own and uh, I remember listening to sessions on One Health several years ago and uh, I think it's a fantastic concept but um, as I stated in the, in the questions uh, have the medical doctors, veterinarians, wildlife biologists and others learned how to play together. That <laughs> I, think, I think we're getting there. I, I think that there's a couple of challenges that I see in, in that. I think it's like many things that, that we embark upon. Um, 
is that everybody likes to collaborate as long as, long as they're in charge. And then that sounds like a little, a, a little harsh, but, but, but what I've seen is, is like, when you've got One Health, you've got Eco Health, and you have Planetary Health. And, and they're all overlapping, but they have slightly different uh, perspectives and, and, and focus. One Health has, has become very focused on veterinary public health and zoonotic diseases. Eco Health has, has, has become more focused on environmental justice issues. Planetary Health, is, is focused on yeah, protection of, of our environment, but basically to ensure that human societies can thrive. And I think that fragmentation has been a real challenge for us. Um, and and, it, and what I think will be really beneficial is, is, is can we come up with some sort of common definition of what we mean by One Health, a common purpose like a mission and a set of core values that are associated with that mission. And, and um, I think a really good example actually is the sustainable development goals that, that that um, um, the United Nations came up with, where they've got the, the 17 different different factors, which includes life on Earth and life life under the uh, under the sea, and they've come up with a, like like 196 different different targets, and whether there's a clear articulation of what we're trying to achieve, uh, and and um, the the guiding principles under which we're operating. So I think that's lacking in One Health, um, but intriguingly with with COVID 19. I'm starting to see some opinion pieces very much talking about that as need to getting on the same page. I think the other thing that could be really beneficial is, is I think we need real leadership skills in, in, in bringing people together. Um, and it's actually one thing that I think, you know, for the students is, is um, when you go out in the workforce, it's not just the technical skills that you learn in school, it's also the softer skills, the ability to, 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 to embrace other disciplines, the ability to listen um, you know, across your discipline, the ability to form teams and resolve conflicts among those teams. And where I've seen success take place is when we've had those governance structures in place and, and, and teams formed. And I take influenza as a great example. You know, when, when it first emerged in 2005, 2006, you know, there's a fair amount of sharp elbows between the CDC, USDA and Department of Interior, each trying to sort of, you know, push, push their own mission. But we've had the steering committee going for about 10, 15 years now. Uh, with all these different agencies together. And it's really helped change our perspectives. We understand each other's missions much better. We understand the pressures they're under. And we've shifted from going from having independent missions to really having a collective mission, right? And I think it's really helped shift thinking from, well, you know, waterfowl or risk for, 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 for poultry production. Therefore, we should destroy habitat and we should just you know, destroy what, um, waterfowl populations to, well, what we control is on-farm biosecurity. And, and that's the point of control that allows wildlife uh, to, to coexist with, with poultry production. So I'm seeing some successes in that regard, but I think we've got a long way to go. Great <laughs> question. And I'm sorry, it was a long answer. A, a good answer though. <laughs> I have another question here <laughs> regarding transmission of information such as what you've presented today. Um, the person asking questions serves on an association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and Animal Health Committee and Boone and Crockett uh, Animal Health Committees. Could you kind of summarize how perhaps this information has been transmitted to age organizations such as this, or perhaps how the word could get out better than it has been already? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think this information is disseminated through the, the usual channels, right? There's a fair amount of publications are, are, are produced. We give presentations at, um, at scientific conferences. I've seen presentations at the, you know, Association of Fish Wildlife Agency meetings. But, but um, I think there's two things that I think about is I think, one, we need to start talking outside our usual, usual audiences, right? And start conveying this information. So um, going to sort of... Um, Groups like so, so like the Society of Environmental Journalists, they have an annual conference. Mm -hmm. I think there'll be a great venue to start to, to present some of this information because they have huge influence. Right? They can get information, write articles in, 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 in the newspaper. Um, there's, I think there's a, a Society of Environmental Lawyers um, getting, getting information out to them and they can actually start having, you know, helping us have, have, some, have some influence. I think that, you know, that communication strategy is, I think is, is a critical piece and not something I have a lot of experience of, but I think what the question is getting at is, is how do we have transformative change, right? We've seen change and very positive change in a number of ways. Like I think like the Me Too movement, and the Black Lives Matter movement have really changed um, the way we, we understand and think about those, those societal issues. 
I, I think we need a similar type of transformative movement when it comes to One Health and wildlife health. Um, but I don't know how to, how to do that, um, but, but, but I really think it would be something that would be critical. Great, that, great comment, <clears throat> that comment relates to a, another question I have, and that is dealing now with COVID-19, uh, we all know that it's an emerging infectious zoonotic disease, but I have to wonder about our general public, if they really connect the dots and if they think about it actually as a disease that's, you know, perhaps that not different from, from other zoonotic diseases that we've dealt with, you know, for, for decades. This seems like a, a grand opportunity for wildlife disease specialists to jump on and say, hey, this is a wildlife related disease, um, a zoonotic, we need to be aware and concerned about this. But I'm not sure the public is getting that message. You know, I think initially when it first emerged, I saw a fair number of news articles regarding its origins yeah. and, and, and its emergence and actually saw, I don't know whether you saw, but there was a several um, hearings in Congress regarding this very issue, and even some proposed you know, funding to go towards enhanced surveillance for wildlife diseases you know, globally and, and, and the United States. Um, but I, I, I've, I've seen it sort of decline a little bit as I think the focus has shifted to oh, clearly the impacts on us, you know, on the economic impacts, and how the heck are we going to get out of this situation? So I'm a little worried that the momentum has lot, been lost a little bit, and, and it comes back. And I think you know, be great questions to ask Billy Koresh when he comes on because I, I think he, he he has um, perhaps a different perspective. But for me, I think this is where I think NGOs can play a real role, right? So so I think NGOs are the real should be the real engines of of change, and, and they need to be coming up with these sort of you know, these, these, these radical ideas and new ideas and keep pulling us. Government's only gonna change in the pace in which they believe the electorate's willing to change. And so they're gonna, it's gonna move fairly slowly. Um, and, and, but the way to, you know, so we really need to start changing that public perception um, to, to sort of shift government along. And that to me is a real critical role for the, for the non nonprofit, non-governmental organizations. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a comment, maybe you can re uh, comment on it. Uh, White nose syndrome is a good example for One Health. Oops, it just jumped on me. Um, solving vaccine delivery on bat populations could solve some human delivery issues down the road that we have seen, uh, that we have not even anticipated yet. COVID-19 is also a landscape of fear disease. It is changing human behavior on the landscape the way wolves change elk behavior. Yeah. Well, so the first part of the question, yes, yeah, so yeah, so actually the technology, so I, I, I know I skipped over it rather quickly, but um, traditionally the way they've managed vampire bat populations in South America is, is by culling, and the way they, they cull them is they apply this paste with, a war, with warfarin, um, you know, it's an anticoagulant poison, to, to, to these um, vampire bats, and actually bats are social groomers, so you only have to need, need to paste a few of them with that, with that poison, they go back to the colony, and they all then sort of uh, will, will groom each other and, and destroy the colony. Is actually what they've discovered is actually, as most of us know, culling is not actually a very effective way to, 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 to manage the diseases like that. Bats um, adapt, they actually stop socially grooming in those situations. Um, and so actually, we'd be simultaneously developing this one syndrome vaccine. We've been actually using the same technology to try and develop a rabies vaccine that could be used to manage rabies in vampire po populations. So it's, it, it's, you're absolutely right. I, I think it's a great example of how technologies like that can have multiple benefits across the landscape and actually look for, for better ways to manage the diseases that allow bats and people to coexist. Um, the other part, changing landscape of fear. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I. I, again, I think, you know, going back to that previous comment, I think one of the key thing that we need to start thinking about is behavior change. I honestly, I, I think it really has, for me, really need, we need to sort of rethink our, our relationship with nature, right? And, and, and how we utilize uh, the resources that we, that we have and um, ensure it's done in a more sustainable manner. I've been, 
again, I'm sure Billy will talk to this. So OAE has been working on what it can do in terms of um, the wildlife trade and emerging, emerging diseases. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of calls for blanket bans on wildlife trade. Uh, I think the thinking in the OAE is it, it, that's probably going to be hard to, um, to enact, but also could be detrimental to a lot of communities that rely on wildlife for, for sustenance and, and subsistence um, hunting. And so what they're looking at is, is, you know, improved regulation of these markets and, and um, obviously prohibiting activities that can be at really high risk, but then allowing other activities, you know, through better regulation, more sanitary uh, procedures, as well as better surveillance. So I, I do think this is, again, I come back to, I'm repeating myself. This is a really important moment to actually really reflect on our relationship with nature and can we actually start having some, some true changes in how we behave? There's one last uh, thread of conversation that's going on. It's associated with wildlife rehabilitators, uh, wildlife rehabbers and researchers working on bats, mustelids, and felids are aware of zoonoses concerns. Um, and the DNR has taken proactive measures and temporary, temporarily prohibiting wildlife rehabbers uh, work on these families. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think that's just more more of a comment, and um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's definitely certainly um, the background to that is is because we know that SARS-CoV-2 is is likely originated from corona -like vir coronaviruses from bats in in Asia. There's been a lot of concern about whether the virus could spill back into North American species. So a lot of uh, entities have taken a precautionary approach to 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 address that by prohibiting or managing certain aspects of, of, of rehabilitation. Um, and it just gets back to that need for that public outreach and public education, right? In fact, actually, there was an interesting study, and it's a slight aside, that, that showed that um, they did a human dementia study in Arkansas that showed up about 7% of, of people believed that North American bats were a source of SARS-CoV-2 in, in North America. So it tells me that information is getting out there, but, but perhaps is being misunderstood. And I, I am very concerned about those potential misconceptions that, that people have. Mm -hmm. um, on a related note on coronaviruses, can you tell us what the latest is on the source of our current uh, COVID-19? You know, initially it was pangolins, then bats, not sure what markets, and then there was genetic engineering that came in. And yeah. Do you know what the current uh, knowledge is? So what I know for sure is, is that... Um, is that SARS-CoV-2 is about 96% related to coronaviruses that have been found in horseshoe bats in China. So, so that, that tells us they're probably cousins. So it's not the, the, the exact virus that it originated from, but it's probably related. So it's highly likely the origin of this virus is, is, is bats in, in China. Now, the other um, coronaviruses that turned out to cause human epidemics, SARS and MERS, they adapted through an intermediate host, civic, civic, palm civets in China or, or, or camels in the Middle East. We don't know for sure whether there the is or was an intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2 or what that host was. Most likely candidate that I've heard is, is pangolins, but that's not been definitively proven. Now, it seems like uh, the original detections of the wet market in Wuhan may have been a sort of misnomer in that there's now been evidence to show that the SARS-CoV-2 was likely circulating before they found out in the market. So it seems unlikely that that wet market was, was the source of, 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 the, of the virus. So, and there's been some discussion about whether there's a fair amount of direct handling of bats. And so, so I think people are kind of trying to go back and sort of backtrace um, where this virus could have, could have in, intersected with with people, but again, it's 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 still undetermined. I think there's a World Health Organization team has gone out to China to try and uh, ferret out what what the source is. But it seems like it's a natural occurrence. It seems like bats are the, are, are the likely origin. The I, I think the general consensus amongst the scientific community is no evidence that it was a engineered virus or no or, or no evidence that it escaped from a lab in, in mm. Wuhan. Hmm. 
Well, Jonathan, we certainly appreciate the time you've spent with us. Um, you've held the audience very well. There's still nearly 30 people hanging in there and we're at least 20 minutes past due. Um, I think we all appreciate the time and effort that you put into this presentation, uh, certainly enlightening. And, and uh, we thank you for the time you spent with us. Yeah, no, thanks very much for having me. I very much appreciate it. And um, more than happy to, hey, I'll put my email address in the chat box. So if folks want to follow up with me afterwards, I, I'm more than happy to, to do that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs> I am going to.